Hey, everyone. How's it going? Great. Hey. Happy Thursday. Hello. Thursday. Hey, How's it going? Good. Good. Finally getting cold up here. I'm in the East Bay. I think all of you are <laughs> by San Francisco, it's right? Cold. So you would agree? Yeah. I'm in the East Bay also. It's really cold. Yeah. I'm in LA and it's warm. <laughs> <laughs> Always. I'm in the peninsula close to the ocean and it's colder. <laughs> I had, yeah, I had my annual shock moment when I went to the mall last week for an errand and like there was Christmas music playing. I was like, oh, not already. Come on. <laughs> I know Christmas stuff has been out since early October. I feel like. Yeah, we jumped the gun on this one. Usually it's like after Halloween, right? They want to finish up 2020. Let's <laughs> <Exactly. laughs> bring in the new year. Let's go. <laughs> Um, cool. I'll give it just a couple more minutes here. Um, this one's going to be a bit unique and, and hey to all the students who are joining. Welcome. Um, this is the third part of our continuing series on uh, finding your dream job or internship. So special thanks to Eric and Erica and Rosella for continuing to host me and, and have me on. Um, of course, if you're not already aware, this is part of a broader initiative at NDNU to provide students with career coaching resources. And so as part of this webinar, there's also a full end-to-end -end online course that will help you with everything that you need and we're going to be talking about that towards the end as well but to that end I'll go ahead and just paste a link to the program access in case anyone on this call has not seen that before and again we'll address this at the end of the call um, lastly this one's going to be a bit different um, because we're going to be doing a behind the shoulder demo of how I actually conduct research. So I'm gonna be going on my desktop, show you how I actually do things. Um, so it's not just gonna be all slides, which hopefully is a, is a good thing. Um, cool. And my last note here is that we are recording just as an FYI. Eric, Erica, Rosella, any other NDNU related announcements that you wanna make? I think we have another minute or two before we get started. Um. Just a small something. Um, if you have already voted and taken a selfie of yourself with your I voted sticker or your ballot or whatever, send it my way because we're hoping to post those onto the Instagram and the newsletter next week. So um, my email, I'll go ahead and put that in the chat. So if you have already done that, I would really appreciate that. Um, and anyone that submits a photo will be entered to win NDNU apparel. Awesome. <clears throat> Does that count for staff too? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, <it doesn't>. staff, <laughs> okay, <laughs> Finally got around to watching Ozark. Oh yeah, I'm actually watching it right now. Did what? Did you see the entire thing or just a particular season? Um, I, I think I got up to season four. It's right when they like, yep. got the casino up and running on the boat. How'd you like it? It's a good show, right? Yeah, it's addicting. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't realize this was going to be so bad, but it's so good. Yeah, I'm actually waiting for The Crown, which is coming out in two weeks. Season four, I think it is. That'll be really fun, too, because it's like the Princess Diana series, and there's so much drama with that. So. Right, right. Mandalorian 2 is coming out soon. I think that's on another service, right? Which one is that? Uh, it's not us. <laughs> not us. I wish. It's such a great franchise, right? Yeah. And that's going to be a big release too. Is that like a, a rule? Like you can't associate with any other streaming services? Yeah. If you just say Amazon at the office, you're escorted by security out. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> we, we encourage people to sign up for competitor services just so you know, we're all a fan of entertainment. So <laughs> cool. Um, all right. So let's get into it. I'm going to share my screen.
All right. So today we are talking about how to become an expert without any prior work experience. This is for all the students, whether you're listening live or after the fact, if you're tired of saying, hearing like, oh, you need like a couple of years of work experience for this entry level job. And just like someone give me a break. Like how do I make my first entrance into an industry? Um, and so this this entire process is really going to help you not only land those jobs, but also have really fun conversations with alumni, with professionals in the interview process. I think often when I think back to my experience as a student, I often thought like, oh, if I'm going to have a coffee chat with someone who's like 10 or 20 years older than me, like what could I possibly talk about? And it's so awkward. And this research phase will show you how to acquire knowledge really quickly that's readily available online to really make yourself sound like an industry expert and start to ask really exciting questions when you meet these people. So moving away from what's typical day like to starting to challenge them on trends that you're seeing or, or things that are kind of engaging everyone else in that career path. Um, so that'll be an exciting use case for all the information that we talk about today. By the way, I saw we just had someone else join. There we go. Um, great. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. So as always, we're going to do a quick introduction about myself, go into the presentation, and then jump into a conclusion where we'll tell you more about the exciting program that we have for um, the Career Launchpad and NDNU students. So our goal for you today is quite simple. Um, it's to give you everything you need to understand why industry research is so important when applying to entry-level jobs. And then secondarily, show you how to conduct intense secondary research or industry research to overcome lack of relevant work experience, kind of what I mentioned already. Um, so quick introduction about myself. My name is Sahil. I went to UCLA, then worked in consulting and then Discovery Channel. And now I work at Netflix and entertainment. So I have a really fun career. My brother also co-developed these materials with me and he is a product manager at LinkedIn. Um, he also worked at a number of really fun companies. And so we kind of put our heads together and thought, how can we share everything that we've learned about finding your first job or internship in college? And uh, we noticed that regardless of what you're trying to do, uh, what field or what focus your major is, there are some fundamental truths about recruiting, especially out of college, because everyone's recruiting for entry level positions. And, and that's what this course is geared toward, just sharing those fundamental truths. Um, some brief history about me. Um, I was a band nerd growing up. You can see that picture on the left hand side, uh, played the saxophone, uh, spent a huge time in school focusing on music. So no surprise when I applied to um, UCLA, a very competitive school. I did not get in. I just didn't have the grades of the focus to, to um, get in academically. But a couple months later, the music director at UCLA saw a clip of me on YouTube playing the saxophone. And he was like, you know what, we could use some saxophonists. Why don't you go ahead and give an audition? And uh, long story short, uh, gave that audition and got in through UCLA through the back door, kind of through the marching band program, something that not a lot of students do. So it was a blessing and a curse uh, getting to attend my dream school, but also I'm sure many of you can imagine, maybe not during this pandemic, but um, when you think back to your first class at NDNU, probably being surrounded by dozens of students who on paper were smarter or more likely to succeed than you were, you just, you know, maybe felt a little bit of Foster syndrome. That's certainly what I felt being in this type of a lecture hall at UCLA. And so I really struggled during my first year in college of trying to figure out how am I going to compete with everyone else? Forget finding a job or having leadership positions. How am I going to just survive day to day and not fail out? And I started kind of revisiting this, this problem during my freshman year summer and thought, you know what, instead of being nervous and feeling like an imposter at UCLA, what if I were to embrace it? So like, yeah, I am an imposter. I'm not supposed to be here. I'm a little bit out of my league, but how would a student kind of behave if they were placed on campus um, for 24 hours and on, on their dream campus? And like, how would they take advantage of all the resources around them, all the student brain power around them? And it really made me change my approach to life in terms of anytime I'm in a room where I feel like I'm an imposter, I feel like I'm not supposed to be there, I actually get excited because that means that I can now learn something. I'm going to have an incredible growth opportunity um, ahead. And so that's kind of what I did at UCLA. So my sophomore year through senior year, I started join joining a bunch of student groups, um, started participating, participating more in group study sessions, and just being a lot more involved on campus and less focused and worried about academics. And that just created a so much more fulfilling experience for me. And I was able to then set myself up to get a job that was listed on Glassdoor's top 25 toughest companies to interview with in the country, which is that chart on the right-hand side you see in my mouse, if you can see that, um, a company called LEK Consulting. So everything that I learned about finding a career has worked in some of the most competitive 
battle tested environments uh, you can imagine. My brother Rohan also got an offer from Bain and Company up here. So he has also tried all of these uh, tactics that we teach you in the Career Launchpad program and what we're going to show you today. Um, so these are all things that have worked for both of us and hundreds of other students who have also um, had success. And lastly, this is kind of a fun um, recognition moment that I had when I signed my offer at LEK and got this email from uh, our HR department and I saw some of the other schools that students went to. And here I was kind of a high school student who was a band nerd and surrounded by all this amazing talent. So it's kind of a good reminder of like, hey, it doesn't really matter where you come from. Uh, it's just the a function of the kind of work that you put in, the network that you build, how much you're engaged in your community and opportunities will come at you life, left and right. And so that's kind of a fun uh, takeaway from this email. Okay, so basically, like I said, we figured out the hard stuff, so you don't have to. Um, so let's get into the presentation for today. All right, I'm just gonna adjust my video as well. Um, let's see. Pin myself here. Eric, I just realized your your face was in the picture and picture not at the bottom. So I don't want to put too much pressure on you for the rest of the presentation because because it's going to be in the recording. <laughs> so I change it to mine. Um, cool. Awesome. Thank you for letting me know that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No now worries. You know. <laughs> no worries. There you go. Okay, it's all fixed. So here's what we're going to cover today. The two parts. Number one, why is industry research important? Uh, why do I place so much emphasis on it? And um, why is something as simple as Google searching actually a game changer for your career? And then secondarily, we're going to get into how to conduct intense industry research and underline emphasis on intense because it is intense. Okay, so let's talk about the first part. In last month's webinar, for those of you that attended webinar number two, we talked about how to create a career hypothesis. So if for those of you listening today or, or maybe watching this after the fact, make sure you have a career hypothesis before moving into this industry research phase. I'm gonna brush up on what that is in the following slides. Um, basically, it's the idea that, hey, I don't really know what I wanna do as a college student or recent graduate, so I'm just, just gonna take like a best informed guess. That is what a career hypothesis is. Again, the previous webinars in this series go over that process. And as well, in the Career Launchpad program, we teach you how to create one. And so here's that summary A good career hypothesis is two parts. Uh, first is the type of role and secondarily the type of industry. So some examples, I think I want to become a product manager in the tech industry, or I think I want to become a healthcare provider in the sports industry. So notice there's three big components. Number one, starting with I think, because it's a guess, you have no pressure to, to have it perfect. You're not going to because we're at the beginning of our careers to so say I think. Secondarily, it's what type of role you want, healthcare provider, digital marketer, product manager, finance professional. And then thirdly is a type of industry. How do you want to apply it in sports, makeup, technology, the choice is yours, whatever industry interests you. So that's kind of the, the three-step part, the street, the three-step process to forming a career hypothesis. Okay, so basically there are two ways to become an expert in your target industry. Option one is to get years of extensive experience and option two is to conduct your own research online. And we often think, okay, um, let's say I follow career hypothesis number four here. Like I wanna become a healthcare provider in the sports industry. I'd love to be on the medical team of a professional basketball association team. Um, then we think, okay, I need to, next step is to get an internship or try to find a job. And that's actually quite a big leap to make. And it's pretty difficult as we all know to find an internship in something we don't have any prior experience in. There's actually another step that we can do which is conduct additional online research to really figure out why is my career hypothesis true? What specific things about my career hypothesis uh, gravitate me towards that uh, potential position and just getting more informed. And that's what we're gonna stick with right now. So our goal is to test our career hypothesis as fast as possible. So we value speed over comprehensiveness. Yes, option one, going out and getting a job or internship in that field is gonna give you a lot more hands-on experience, but option two allows you to get like a 80% level of comfort with your career hypothesis in just as little as a week. So think about how long it takes you to find an internship or job versus just a week of research. That is the purpose of why industry research is important, partially. Um, and there's obviously only two possible outcomes after testing your career hypothesis. Either you were wrong and you're like, you know what, sports medicine doesn't sound too fun. I'm gonna change my focus, rethink it. Or you were correct and you can get more specific. Oh, okay, like this seems really interesting. Why don't I focus specifically on basketball? Or why don't I focus specifically on the Olympics? Like you can get even more specific and, and that would be a cool way to kind of really hone in on, on what you're aiming for. 
And like I mentioned, option two is the easiest. So we're gonna go ahead and do that, which is online research. Um, but also consider, you know, Becoming an industry expert can also help you overcome a lack of relevant work experience. Um, consider that when you're applying for entry-level jobs, you're really selling employers on your potential, not your current skill set. This is such an important point for all of you on the call, whether you're a freshman or senior or recent graduate. You know, if you think back to when you applied to NDNU, kind of a similar story, although it was a little bit more of a mix, like NDNU paid attention to your past grades and your academic performance, but also they're making bets on you in terms of, okay, this is a student that we want to cultivate and help grow because we think they're gonna do amazing things in the world. You know, an employer, uh, especially at the entry level stages, doesn't expect, you know, a recent graduate to know complex, you know, an analytical skills or knowing how to deal with patients or whatever, um, whatever career field. It's more about the potential and, and how can you demonstrate that potential or that you have high potential as a college student that is the way you should really frame your recruiting efforts, not really showcasing, oh, I've done a million things in my life this far, I'm so amazing, that's why you should hire me. Um, that's not at all kind of how employers are thinking about entry level jobs. And secondarily, by showcasing your knowledge and enthusiasm for the job you're interviewing for, you'll come across as someone worth investing in. Again, think about it from the person, let's say I'm a hiring manager, I want to have, I have two open intern positions for my, for my team. Um, I'm thinking not, you know, who can I bring in who will totally take over my job and like do, do an amazing job as a, like, as a sophomore at NDNU. Instead, the framing is who can help me with some day-to-day -day work, but also who is someone that I consider worth investing in? Because, hey, no, you know, maybe someday um, they might be a full-time candidate after they graduate and I actually want them on the team longer term. So again, thinking more of the mindset of investing in for the long term, showcasing your potential, rather than having the unfair burden of, you know, I'm 21 or 23 years old and I need to show off that I can do a bunch of amazing things that are relevant to the job. That's simply not the case. Um, and then thirdly, by doing industry research, you'll be able to discuss the following topics that you come across uh, when you come across professionals or even in the interview. You can talk about, you know, major trends that are impacting the target industry, recent news that impacted the industry or major players in the space, and more specifically, the types of problems or challenges that your role that you're interviewing for uh, deals with. Um, on a day-to-day -day basis. So knowing those kind of things will make for a much more rich conversation, whether it's interviewing or networking, rather than asking kind of the typical college student questions of like, what's a typical day like? Um, you know, why do you like this job, blah, blah, blah. It's like moving on to that next level of thinking like a colleague rather than a student asking a colleague for a job. Okay, so hopefully I've convinced you that industry research is important for a variety of reasons, validating your career hypothesis, making up for minimal experience by showcasing your potential and curiosity. And then thirdly, preparing for networking and interviewing, just the fun conversations you can have when you acquire a bunch of knowledge really quickly about a particular topic. So now let's go into how to conduct intense industry research here. Okay, so part two. So we talked about in the first webinar, the kickoff webinar, um, some potential resources, um, and here they are. Google, Google News, Quora, Reddit, and YouTube are just some examples. And I'm gonna do a demo, so I'm gonna go through these examples kind of quickly. On Google, you can do like Digital Advertising Trends 2020 and search it, and then you can come up with a bunch of articles that show off like, okay, these are seven trends to consider, 42 digital marketing trends um, on Snapchat on the right-hand side. Let's say I'm a student and I was interviewing for Snapchat or I wanted to, you know, what is some recent news impacting Snapchat? And at the time of this article, um, they were saying, you know, TikTok, uh, Snapchat is trying to test a TikTok style navigation. Um, so obviously knowing that going into an interview might be interesting context to help you have some interesting conversations. Um, YouTube is another great resource on the left-hand side. Um, so if you type in like product manager undergraduate or nursing professional undergraduate, you'll get a bunch of videos of people teaching you kind of what the concepts are and how to think about being in that career as an entry-level person. And then on the right-hand side, Reddit is a great resource, more so for technical STEM fields. Um, there's a lot of, you know, informal guides that people make or just handy career advice that this forum is great for. So I think taking a step back, it's kind of shocking to students that I'm spending so much emphasis on like, dude, you're literally telling me to Google search stuff. Like, how is that insightful? <laughs> and I think that's the paradox is it seems so simple and it's like right in front of you, but no student is really doing this to the level at which Rohan and I feel 
would be beneficial. Like students don't, aren't in the habit of like Google searching trends about a career path or like watching YouTube videos about what it's like to be in that role or what makes a good, for example, product manager. These are all resources that you have available to you and they're absolutely free. Um, and it's kind of paradoxical that what's available for free and right in front of you isn't being used. So that's kind of the purpose of why Rohan and I teach this, this method. And now the key here is as you go through your research, you wanna keep a separate Word or Google Doc um, to keep track of any interesting or important trends that you come across in your research. And basically this Google Doc will eventually become a study guide for your networking interviews, networking chats, and your actual job interviews, because you're gonna have synthesized all the interesting things that you found online, the trends, the company news and all that, and you can use that as a study guide. It's a very cool way to kind of prep for these conversations. Have a chat here. Hi, uh, Tess says, hi, I find this great for biomath marketing research or not much for education and counseling. Can you please speak to that? Yeah, why don't we do an example in the counseling space? So um, what I'm gonna do here, Tess, um, to answer your question very shortly, it is the exact same process, whether it's education, counseling, or whatever, this process works regardless because it's about acquiring knowledge and showcasing your curiosity for something in which you don't have a lot of experience in. Because again, in the interview, that person's thinking, not thinking, does this, does this student have the right skill set? They're thinking, is this a student worth investing in and worth putting my time into? So at that point, let's do a demo. And if I can ask Tess, if I can put you on the spot, um, can you give me an example career path that you're interested in that maybe is around education or counseling? It seems like you're interested in that. And we can actually do a demo around those topics right now. Sure. I mean, counseling is a master's program. Um, so mm -hmm. I'm a I'm in the master's program. Um, we do have a practicum and um, a lot of connections already once we graduate. Um, so I don't quite know what you want me to tell you, but for education, um, someone coming out of undergrad, um, they might just have a new license and now they have to find a job in a school system. Does that help? Is that good? <laughs> gotcha. Um, I'm going to ask you, which example do you want to do together right now? Um, do you want to focus on an education track or a counseling track? Up to you. Uh, uh, counseling. Okay, Thanks. let's do counseling. And what kind of counseling? Um, I don't know. Psychotherapy? Uh, Rosea, speak to yeah. us. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Um, so being a therapist, so like a mental health therapist. Um, okay. So you know, it could be um, in, in, let's just do, let's say people are going into um, working on a nonprofit or agency, um, working um, with different populations, but, you know, they're searching for that, that kind of position. Okay. So mental health therapist, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Cool. Awesome. Um, so I'm going to sign out of my slides here and go into Google. Okay. Can everyone see my, my screen here, my browser? Can I get a yes from someone? Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Cool. Okay. So mental health therapist. So here's what we're going to do very simply. Let me, I have a Google doc here that I've opened and I've called my career hypothesis. I'm just going to say mental health therapist. Um, and then like non profit right? Kind of like, this is the proxy for like what industry, like mental health therapists can serve a variety of different industries, right? So we'll say nonprofit just for now. Um, so this is an example of where you would just start a blank Google doc and get into some of the research. So let's copy mental health therapist here. Um, okay. I'm sorry, this Zoom bar is really annoying. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. So Mental health therapist. So just starting off with a basic Google search here. Um, so you can already see some interesting things. So mental health counselor, type of care, uh, a lot of like government official sites, finding a counselor, et cetera. Okay, so um, again, this is just to show you in real time how I'm learning about this career field and trying to get more informed. So I'm gonna type in mental health therapist, um, let's say undergrad or you said it was a master's job, so master's. Absolutely, uh, Sahil, sorry. Um, yes, it's a master's program. So we spend three years like learning about it and mm -hmm. learning how to do it. So mm -hmm. I guess my question is more like, how do you get a job in it? You know, mm -hmm. you can work at 
um, at a practicum site and then work um, and then you know that next step getting a job with that uh, organization or you can find a whole new one so my, that's my question thanks <laughs> gotcha yeah so this industry research is going to make you more informed so it's going to complement all the things that you learned in your formal education um, and then you're going to use this and part of the upcoming webinars and what we teach in the launchpad program is then reaching out to alumni or just random strangers on LinkedIn um, or part of mental health therapist groups who also work in those fields to have conversations about some of these trends that you find online and just trying to engage them at the level of curiosity that they're in with their job. So it's kind of, I think my answer to your question is less so like, okay, you have the degree now, try to find a mental health therapist position online and apply to it. I think that's a simple baseline level of how to recruit. But the new way that Rohan and I are teaching is how can you then sub, uh, supplement your, your formal education with ad hoc online information, become knowledgeable about certain trends and topics that interest you, and then have conversations with professionals to get them to think, oh, you know, Sahil wants to be a mental health therapist, but even though he doesn't have a lot of experience, he clearly is enthusiastic and has curiosity. Let me see if there's a position available for him at my company or something that I can create. Does that make sense? Yeah. Cool. So let's still go through this example. So mental health, health therapist um, counseling um, trends. So again, trends is, and then we can add like 2020. Uh, you can add trends in 2020 um, to kind of, um, make it more recent. And so what we're gonna do here is um, go through a couple of examples. So the rise of online therapy and mental health apps. So that can be, your, so what we're gonna do here is just go through a bunch of tabs, right? Very quickly. Trends in therapy in 2020, um, mental health threat trends, um, mental health blogs to keep in mind, um, a lot of formal research, um, maybe mental health trends 2020. Um, so something around COVID. So for example, here's where it's like bringing it to life. If you're going to be talking to a mental health professional, um, you know, anytime soon within the next year or even two, it's like, it's, I think it's really, it'd be really weird if you had a whole conversation with that person without mentioning COVID because of how impactful COVID has been to mental health and people working from home. So this is kind of an example of where bringing in topical stuff and having a conversation about things that that other person is probably thinking about on a day-to-day -day basis can have you can allow you to have an intellectual conversation at their level rather than a student asking someone, hey man, do you have a job? And it's kind of like the conversation kind of fizzles right there and then. It's kind of, again, reinforcing the purpose of all of this stuff. Um, and it seems like digital mental health is a trend. So I'll stop there because this is simply an exercise. Um, but to give you an idea of how far I would go, I would literally dig deep into like six pages of Google search results and like um, like start like even opening up tabs here. So I have like 40 tabs open and then I just go into my Google doc and start kind of w working through some of these. So let me give an example of how I would do that. So the rise of online therapy and mental health apps. So there's this idea of mental health apps, um, you know, so better help is one. Um, so I might go into here and just type in, you know, some interesting trends. So let's start off with um, trends, recent trends, uh, mental health apps. And then I would just literally go here and um, like literally copy and paste and then go through the same. And, and it, again, this is not something you have to do, like follow the book, it's whatever you find interesting. So it's like, oh, teen counseling, like um, school counselor. So teen, teen counseling seems like a service. Okay, interesting, pride counseling. So that might be something of interest to you. Um, doctor on demand, seven cups of tea. Um, you know, maybe you wanna work for a self-care mental health app. So Calm is one. Again, I'm just totally making this up, right? Um, if this seems a bit unstructured, good, because this is how actual research <laughs> works. Um, so calm. Okay, cool. So that's an example. And if you want bonus points, you can copy the source and then you can include it um, in here for future reference. So that's that one done. Now let's pick something else. Um, Trends in therapy 2020. Um, well, this seems to be focused on a number of things, maybe not directly a focus, mental health trends. 
um, online therapy apps. Hmm. Okay, so here's another interesting thing that hopefully you guys can learn with me. Um, and by the way, I appreciate not everyone on here might care so much about mental health, but we're going through an example here of how I would do the research. We've now clicked on two different links where people have mentioned online therapy apps. So here's an example test where um, you're, you're, you just graduated or you're graduating to be a mental therapist. And maybe there are new companies or opportunities where um, you could work for one of these online therapy apps because they might need mental therapists on the other side. So just you're, you're starting to learn about all the opportunities that are available to you, uh, right? So, and if multiple sources mention the same trend, it's probably, you know, a good thing to keep in mind. So let's continue onwards. Um, some more trends here. Uh, again, I'm trying to go quickly just so we, we get on some relevant stuff. Um, okay, interesting. So here's some stuff around mental health care suffering due to the pan pandemic. Um, so utilization declines. So again, I'm totally just saying these broad trends, um, mental health utilization declining due to COVID um, and some data points here. I think we have someone on an iPhone that has their microphone, if they could please turn it off. Okay, so I'm gonna pause there because I don't wanna bore too many people. Um, again, here's seven more digital trends. So you can see the, the quality of the advice and the relevancy of it varies. This is why you need to spend just four to six hours just like Google searching the heck out of like trends or, or anything that you want, mental health, um, you know, masters, jobs, um, that kind of thing, and just start to like, like what you can do with a master's degree in mental health and just start to understand what opportunities are there and put them in this document. So for example, to give you an idea of how robust this exercise is for me, when I interviewed for my job at Netflix, my Google doc was 62 pages long of notes, 62 pages. Um, and from that, I created a five page Cliff's Notes version of, um, of, of the like the most interesting stuff. And I use that as my study guide. So I know we just spent like 10 minutes going through some scrappy examples here, but just imagine spending a week digging through some of these trends or things that you're interested in and really coming out with a lot more information to complement the formal education that you all have from NDNU. I see we have a chat here um, off topic, but how do you know if an undergrad should go straight to a job versus a grad school? Um, Ali, can we ask that question at the end? And I will certainly get to that. It's a great question. Um, Cool. So let's go on to another example uh, where we're going to search YouTube and we're going to say mental health therapist day in the life. Let's see that, right? Um, and you'll see there's like so many videos, right? Day in the life of mental health therapist, how to become a licensed therapist, um, you know, the pros and cons, et cetera, et cetera. So, so many people are creating these communities that you can watch. And then again, take notes in, in this section here. Uh, mental health therapist um, after masters. So there's so many you know, things here, uh, grad school talks, um, 10 things I wish I knew. Let's even do like mental health um, apps. And like, there's a lot of industry trends, right? Um, doctors discussing these things, um, mental health industry or mental health trends, latest trends in mental health. Um, so again, guys, hopefully I'm just giving you an idea of like, this is all stuff that you have access to. Um, and a good indicator is as you continue to build out your notes, if you start watching some of these videos and you're like, dude, this is so boring. Like, <laughs> I, I, I hate doing this research. It feels like schoolwork. Then that's probably a good sign that you shouldn't become a mental health therapist or you should try to pivot into something else. On the other hand, if you're doing some of this research and you're like, whoa, like BetterHelp seems like, like one of these apps would be really cool to, to um, work with. So BetterHelp, um, you know, so like, you know, some people applying to the therapist, um, some people, um, you know, giving reviews and so you can learn more about the opportunity. Again, this is just ways for you to kind of experience potential career paths without having to go out and find an internship or job. And imagine spending a week of doing this and at the end of the process, uh, you just have so much more information and you're gonna have such a next level conversation with a professional that you network with rather than a student saying, hey, I'm a master's student, I'm graduating soon, do you have a job or, or that kind of a thing. So just wanna showcase again, how important this kind of in-depth research can really become if you kind of spend time on it and really build it out. Um, so I'm gonna pause there to see if there are any questions about this approach or how to put it into practice.
and maybe specifically from Tess about maybe seeing the value of doing some of this research. I think it's great. Um, I do think even if you don't, I mean, you cannot like research, but like the subject. So um, mm -hmm. yeah, I think, yeah, I think it's great. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Research is just one um, you know, aspect of how to be a professional um, in, in that regard. Um, and again, I just typed in mental health nonprofit um, and you can just play around with this stuff, right? Um, great episode from Hassan Minaj, shameless plug, right? <laughs> Why it's so hard to get mental health care. Um, you know, sometimes you watch this fun stuff and it really informs you. So again, just imagine deep diving on this stuff and really becoming, um, you know, intensely focused on the opportunities here, so. So he'll have a question. Would you also recommend, I think you mentioned this before, but possibly looking on entering um, like networks, like you said, like a, like a therapist network, or I know that I've looked online on Facebook too, and places like that where there are groups um, of like professional, I don't know, uh, therapists uh, network or things like that, where um, folks can just like post like questions or, um, you know, hey, I'm looking you know, this is my situation. I'm looking for some support with this. And, you know, maybe that be another way of networking. Totally. That's something that I do in my career as well. So if you just Google search like mental health therapist, professional networks, you'll see that there is a bunch here. Now, sometimes a lot of these are like big, gigantic beasts, like American healthcare counselors or American mental health counselors might be like just a ridiculously big organization. So it can seem intimidating. Um, right. But let's go through an example where maybe we type in on, um, LinkedIn. Um, what's the example here? Mental Health Counselors Association. Tess, do you know about this one? I do. There's a lot of fun associations yeah. <laughs> and they're great, um, I don't know, conferences uh, that I'd highly recommend going to, to network. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I basically just searched that into LinkedIn. I'm going to click on, you know, one of them here. Um, and you know, there's a bunch of people that show up. Let me go ahead and do another search here. So that's one way, I definitely agree. Um, one other thing that you can do here, if we click enter and we search for people and all filters. Okay, so let's do a school and DNU and let's do title mental health. And by the way, we go through how to do all of this in the Launchpad program. Click apply. 91 people, NDNU alumni who are in mental health, counseling, therapy, et cetera, et cetera. These are all professionals that you can reach out to. Um, don't mean to put this random person on the spot, but <laughs> you can just see her profile and you can kind of look at, okay, what journey has she been through? Okay, she's actually a recent student. So um, let me go back. Um, you know, there are some, let's see, mental health clinician. Um, and by the way, they don't need to be alumni. Um, they, it's just better for alumni because they're going to be more likely to respond to you, but they can be, you know, let's say they were companies that you wanted to work at. So let's say, um, let's say better health is something that you'd want to work for. Um, we can go back here and we can remove NDNU and we can do uh, better companies. Let's go, come on. Better, is that, was it better health? Uh, remove the keywords. I always give feedback to my brother that LinkedIn's interface needs to be better. If you have LinkedIn gripes, let me know. <laughs> let my brother know. Um, so again, 1,100 people who are in some way affiliated with BetterHelp. So I'm making this up, but let's say if you wanted to work um, at a company like BetterHelp, you can kind of click on these profiles or connect with them and, and try to have a conversation with them about what it's like. And again, this is where you would talk about the trends, the career path, how BetterHelp is impacting um, people during COVID. So you can start to string together this narrative. And all of a sudden, again, the impression that the other person gets is this is not just a sophomore at NDNU asking me for an internship or job. This is a sophomore at NDNU who has clearly done his or her homework um, or master's student. Um, and, and really want, is, is deserving of an opportunity if I see one that comes across. And if you do this multiple times, I'm talking like you have two or three of these conversations per week 
I promise you in a matter of months, you're gonna have opportunities coming to you left and right that you never knew existed. And also when you apply to jobs, let's say BetterHelp actually put, it, put a position up on Handshake or NDNU's job portal. Um, when you know people inside the company, that's how you get that extra leg up. So this is how everything kind of blends together. Good point though, on the whole idea of like joining associations and stuff, totally agree. Um, great, okay, so essentially just putting it back to the slides here. Um, this is a calendar that you can follow. Uh, we went through this in the first webinar, um, but just something that you can take home with you, um, you know, of how quickly you can become an industry expert through just one week of research. So imagine, let's say you wanted to start on Monday of next week. What is the actual step-by-step -step process you would do to, to do this research? So Monday you would spend researching the origins and history of, of, of your target industry. So it's like, how did mental health start? How has it evolved over the years? This is where you're going to discuss things like, okay, you know, maybe at first it wasn't even valued as a science, which is I'm guessing part of its history because it's such a new field, right? And then all of a sudden there start to be like a lot more breakthroughs and how mental health is supremely important to a number of other things. Then all of a sudden you have the digital aspect of it. So de delivering telemedicine or teletherapy, right? So you can start to see the shape of the industry. Then on Tuesday, you can focus on, okay, who are the major players in the target in the mental health space? And specifically for nonprofits, who are some of the bigger nonprofits out there? Maybe who are the nonprofits that are targeting specific populations that I'm a fan of, like you know, LGBT or maybe underprivileged youth or whatever specific target area population that you want to serve? And what is the latest news on them? On Wednesday, you could do more research on maybe winners and laggards is probably not a relevant or appropriate way to determine to, to describe mental health um, companies because everyone is probably in more altruistic nonprofit mode. But like, who are the ones that are doing really cool things? Might be another way to phrase it, right? Some of those apps or or whatever. Um, Thursday, you would research in like recent trends. So definitely COVID would be uh, relevant here. Like, you know, you should be able to have for mental health specifically, and just an, an example here, you should be able to have like a solid 30 to 40 minute conversation with a professional about like how COVID has impacted mental health and has created new innovations or forced people to innovate new ways of delivering mental health support. Like that's the level of rigor you should have even as a college student, whether you're a freshman or a master's student, because that information is available to you online. So that's kind of what, what I'm building towards. Um, Friday are you know, more future trends. Saturday, you might start to focus it back down. Okay, I've done research this week. Let's talk about specific career paths and potential roles that are available to me after I graduate or as an intern. And then Sunday, you would have synthesis time. It's like, okay, let me take a step back. Let me look at my Google notes. Like what, what is interesting here? Like what have I gravitated towards? What are some things I might wanna build a career around in the short term? This is how everything kind of comes together. So that's kind of a sample week long calendar. And again, four to six hours a day. So it is quite a bit, you can space it out over two weeks or three weeks, but after the end of this process, you're gonna be surprised at how much more you know. Um, and to your point, Tess, if you already have that formalized education, the combination of the two is just gonna be very, very helpful when you go through the recruiting process. All right, um, are there any other questions about the research phase specifically? I wanna make sure that I address any of those. I think the simple thing is execution. It's literally, what are we doing? We're Google searching and YouTube searching, um, and then just copying anything interesting that we find in a separate note stock. The hard part is the amount of hustle that's required to do this, because it does feel at times, you can, you kind of saw me at first, I was struggling to find relevant articles or relevant search terms. And after you you spend a couple hours kind of figuring out those, those keywords or whatever, things that interest you, you'll start to get into a groove of how to do this. Um, looks like we have someone in the chat. Um, Tess says, North California, South Cal, General California, Countrywide, International Counseling Associations. Oh God, are, are those like associations? Is that what you're talking about? Oh yeah, I was just saying like, there's so many associations yeah. <laughs> and people and connections. Yeah, and one pro tip on LinkedIn, if you join some of these associations and other people are part of them, I think you can actually message them for free. So you don't need to pay for LinkedIn or do any of that. And by the way, we cover all the nuances of LinkedIn reaching out in the course, but just kind of a pro tip there. So it might be good for you to join a couple of these professional associations on LinkedIn, just so you have access to, to reach out to some people. And uh, a lot of these associations have company websites. Um, so you can literally find the contact info of whoever is on the committee or the board. And I promise you, if you just say, um, I'm a student at this university, um, I'm really interested in a career in this space. I saw your career and that you're part of this association. Would you have time uh, sometime in the coming weeks to just chat about the career 
uh, or chat about the field, what things that the association is dealing with given COVID and just um, any advice you have for me as an, as an aspiring mental health therapist. And I promise you that um, you're gonna get a good response rate from Vax. Again, because you can play the student card, uh, because you're showing a genuine interest in their career. And that one person at the American, what was it? The American Mental Health Association, like who knows how many connections they have to other people, right? So this is kind of how those opportunities start to show up and why relying on job postings alone and just applying by submitting your resume is kind of the outdated, no longer right way to, to recruit for a job. Okay, so let's get into the conclusion here and then we'll open it up for questions at the end. Um, at this point, you know, obviously we've walked through kind of how to do research um, and we've walked through in previous webinars how to do a number of other things. Um, so instead of going it alone and trying to figure this stuff out on your own, um, you know, NDNU has graciously offered to make this program available, again, step-by-step -step way from coaches like Ron and I who have helped students like you in a number of different fields. Um, and remember, it takes the average student three to six months to find a job. And through this process, we can get you there just a couple of weeks with intense rigor, right? And so that's where the Career Launchpad comes in. It's basically how to find a job or internship in any competitive industry as an undergraduate or as a master's student. I need to amend that because it does work for both and we've helped both. Um, types of students. And it's over 21 modules of, you know, online course content, best practices and behind the shoulder demonstrations like I just did. And you can access it anytime and anywhere. And as you can see, it's pretty dang comprehensive from everything from how to figure out what you want to do, um, all the way to negotiating your job offer um, and, and how to interview and all that kind of stuff. So it really is comprehensive. And we normally have students paying $3.97 for this course um, every single week. We have a bunch of students that pay for it. But luckily, as an NDNU student, they've made it available completely free, uh, absolutely free, zero dollars. Um, and so the way that you take advantage of that is by clicking on the link in the chat box um, to get started. And so that's kind of the link that I was driving to. Um, and if anyone doesn't have access to it or has issues accessing it, uh, feel free to let myself or Eric know and we can help you out there. All right, at this point, I'm gonna go ahead and open it up for questions, thoughts, responses to anything that we discussed today. Test gives me the thumbs up. I'd be curious if anyone on here found any of the walkthroughs that I did like counterintuitive or you're still doubtful as to whether or not this would be helpful, hopefully not, but feel free to challenge me on this stuff because I help students all the time and this is a way that they get exposure to new opportunities. Um, and again, nothing I did requires you to have years of experience or even a degree in that field. Sahil, can you paste that Facebook page one more time? Mm -hmm. uh, yep. One second. Um, and what Eric is talking about is we have a Facebook group for students to join uh, where they receive ongoing supports. We host ad hoc uh, group Q&A calls. I'm actually going to start a new idea of doing office hours. So uh, 20 minute blocks where students can kind of book time on my calendar. If they have any questions uh, that's relevant to them. So we're going to be piloting that as well shortly. Um, so that's the link to join the, did I paste it correctly? Yeah, it's the second link. Let me try to space it out. Second link to Facebook group. There it is. And then did you want to go back to Ali's question about um, Yes. how do you know if, if an undergrad should go straight to a job rather than grad school? Yes, yes, good question. So I think it depends, right? So if you're going to be a lawyer or doctor, obviously there are certain aspects, even maybe a teacher or a therapist, like there are certain fields where um, being a, having a master's is required. And so it's important that you understand what are those requirements, right? And I would say um, that's kind of the only situation where you should go directly from undergrad to grad school is if you know for the job that you want, it's an absolute requirement. In that case, you know, it's probably a, a better idea. Now I will say, however, even in that situation and for every other situation, I always tell students to get at least two to three years of work experience in whatever field that they want to. Um, a, because then they get more conviction as to whether or not their career hypothesis was correct. And then they can double down with grad school. And a lot of great grad programs, including NDNU, I'm sure 
uh, the admissions counselors value someone who has actual experience on the job and is then applying uh, versus students applying from the undergrad level because they don't really have a, additional experience, right? And also for you as a student, if you think about your life, chances are you've spent the past 21, 24 years of your life in a classroom setting. And it really allows you to mentally reset if you go off into the workplace, um, learn some practical skills, and then apply back to grad school to pick up more of the theoretical concepts that will allow you to elevate your career. So Alan, to answer your amazing question, whether it's business, engineering, um, even teaching or mental health, um, in, except in the cases where it's absolutely required, in which case I would you know, figure out, okay, what programs are good feeders into the employers that you wanna work for. Um, in general, my advice here is to not go to grad school immediately after undergrad, work for two or three years, really figure out if it's an area where you wanna double down and then go ahead and, and look for a grad school program that can further your career um, in that regard. Because sometimes it won't, sometimes it will, it's all dependent to that situation. Does that make sense, Sally? Um, thought specifically for public health. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of, I think public, well, there's a lot of like public policy, um, master's programs or master's in public health and all of that. Um, I, for, you know, I wanna caveat by saying I'm not a public health expert, right? Um, but I think my hypothesis and my judgment tells me that you could probably find an internship an apprenticeship or even a part-time job working in some aspect of mental health to figure out if that's the right career path for you before committing to another two more years of schooling. Um, I'm also just keeping in mind the tuition burden that that might face. Um, so I'd really want you to get some more experience for public health um, and really be sure that it's something that you want to double down in before kind of committing to more grad school. And I don't, I'm, I have a very hard time believing that public health requires a master's degree for any type of experience. Yeah, and Ali says, uh, doubtful about the job market next year because of COVID. Totally agree. I hear you on that. It's a very volatile job market. I think the best that we can do right now as students is notice that a lot of the online research that I walk through does, isn't really impacted by COVID in terms of like, you can still do it. Um, you can still reach out to professionals and alumni to have those phone calls. Yes, people might be more or less busy depending on their situation. But I think the thing to remember is um, professionals are actually a lot more empathetic than you would believe. Um, you know, unfortunately, these financial, political, um, you know, biological now incidences happen every couple of years, whether it's the 2008 crash or the dot-com bubble or whatever, and college students enter a very volatile job market. And a lot of times professionals can relate to that. And if you just mentioned that you're a student and you're looking to just have a conversation with someone, um, if you do that, if you make that request enough times, people will respond. Not everyone, but people will respond. And you'll have a good conversation and you'll set yourself up so that when the job market eventually starts to improve, you'll have planted all of these seeds that are now you can go back to them and ask if there's any opportunities. Or when you do see opportunities, you can reach back out to those people that you networked with and say, hey, remember we had that conversation back in back in November or back in October? Um, you know, the advice that you gave me was really helpful. I've done some more studying. I'm really passionate about this job. I think it'd be a great fit. Is there any way that you can put a referral in or just let the recruiter know that I exist? Um, and just a simple gesture can completely separate yourself from all the other resumes. So this is a long-term strategy that I think if you apply it today for the next couple of months, as the job market starts to improve, um, you will have done the hard legwork to set yourself up for success. Can I um, add something, Sahil? Um, yeah. Not the, again, not a public health expert, but from what I'm noticing um, is that um, you know everyone is adapting, um, and I can only speak from the mental health field because that's kind of where I, where I've worked in um, specifically. But um, I know that public health also has had to make um, drastic adjust adjustments um, and kind of uh, you know support a lot of folks in um, in the situation that's going on right now as well. So um, I see a lot of of like transformation. So I just, I wanted, uh, I think it's Ali, I believe, just wanted to instill hope in saying that yes, the job market, you know, did take a hit. Um, but also I think that, um, you know, really like really knowing that um, we're, these times are changing, like everything is gonna, is gonna start going into like, tel like telehealth, right? Or like, you know, um, more of uh, different ways, I guess, of reaching folks. And so I think that the job market will like, you know, it's taken a hit, but I think that it's adjusting and we'll need more support um, after this um, pandemic. Yeah, plus one to that, it's a great point. I think Ali follows up with, um, you know, there's lots of undergrads struggling this year, so there's almost double the number of applicants um, for the few jobs that are out there. That's a sharp observation to that. I would say, 
how many students are doing kind of the, the method that Rohan and I teach in the Career Launchpad program? Probably very few. So it's the ones that put in the work are going to stand out. And I think that goes to show because there's so many applications and resumes, like putting yours in that stack is going to be even harder of a strategy. So uh, it, it kind of proves my point of how applying to jobs that you see online and hoping to hear back is no longer going to be a viable strategy. Um, I would also say, Ali, to more directly answer your question, um, were you asking for grad? Yeah, you were the one asking for grad school. Um, I would definitely, definitely not advocate um, the, the thinking behind going to grad school just because the job market is bad right now and thinking that it's going to fix your problems. I think that's going to set yourself up for more debt and it's not clear that things will improve by then. So I would rather you face the tough challenge of trying to find a position that's somewhat relevant to your aspirations. Um, if not, maybe adjacent, like just you're in the same room or you're in the same environment, any way that you can kind of work in that environment and get some money and get some skills um, and then kind of reapply and be more aggressive when things open up. I just don't want, I, I don't want to be mindful of recommending students to get into more debt as kind of a waiting room strategy until the job market gets better. Um, because even when you're a grad student and I coach grad students all the time, I think about it in two years, you're still going to be asking me the same questions of like, how do I find a job? Like grad school is not a secret key to unlock doors. Yes, it can be a great validation. It gives you more credibility. Um, but at the end of the day, um, you still have to do the hard work of applying and networking and all that. And I'd rather you feel those pain points and get good at it now at the, at the level that you're at so that when you do attend grad school, you're just on this next level. You have laser focus and you can fully take advantage of the resources around you. It's just a better strategy for, for the education. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Ali says, that was my original strategy, I think maybe to go to grad school, but I think I might as well just start applying uh, to internships and, and networking too. I want to emphasize that, right? Uh, but definitely, I think you get more out of doing an internship during the summer um, than researching graduate school programs to attend next fall. I just think you're going to learn a lot more. And um, who knows, maybe I'm I'm, um, you know, maybe you're wrong and you're like, you did the internship and you're like, you know what, this isn't for me or you're right. And you know what, this internship was so awesome. Now I'm going to get even more specific with the types of grad programs that I apply to or the types of things that I study or the types of professors that I even want to work with. Like you can get so freaking um, specific. And here's the cool part. When you do that, um, grad schools are really impressed because they're like, wow, this student knows exactly why they want to apply to my university. They have conviction about their career. And all of a sudden you end up opening yourself up to even better grad school programs because you're so specific. So I think that's also another lost insight amongst undergrads applying straight to grad school is you kind of lose that perspective about what you want out of life because you spent the past 21 years in a classroom setting. So kind of taking a step out of that environment, revisiting your life purpose and what you want and trying some things here and there will actually make your grad school application a lot stronger. I would just like to echo and comment a little bit on that. Earlier, you mentioned when doing this research um, and putting together your notes for your career path and really um, gaining the information necessary to have under your belt, right, when going into um, your first career. Uh, you mentioned, you know, you may come across um, content or um, specific um, ideas that don't really, that may bore you. You mentioned it may bore you, so maybe that's not. Um, I think it's important to take note of those things that actually don't apply to you or don't align with where you see yourself headed, right? Um, so on that notion of being selective about certain information and content you're coming across in your particular field, I think it's important to know what you don't want the same way you want to know and highlight and really reflect about where you do see yourself headed, right? So um, in thinking about grad school and thinking about, um, you know, which nonprofit or careers or what role you really want to, to head towards, um, knowing self and doing that self-reflection work is also really important. I just want to highlight that as well. Um, when you're in grad school, you know, if you are working and going to school, always keeping that purpose with you is what's really going to help you in kind of harnessing, um, you know, that, that title, that role that you want to get to. Um, so always just staying true to, to that part of yourself. The why. <laughs> yes, the why. the why. Always keep the why. <laughs> Super important. I just wanted to, I just wanted to put in my two cents, but thank you. That is a point worth emphasizing. So thank you for doing that. Yeah.
And and by the way, just gonna re harp on my point to the question about grad school. The why is often an application essay question. Like why? So they're gonna ask you. People are gonna ask you, right? So you can't get away from that question. Cool. I know we're at time. I have a couple more minutes if there are any other questions that people would like to ask. All right. Um, Eric, anything else from your end or Erica? I think we have, this is part of a monthly series. By the way, if you found this helpful, um, please do invite your friends and let them know. Um, obviously, uh, when, if you join the Career Launchpad program, uh, let us know how we can help. You can find me on LinkedIn. I'm very curious about your experience with the program so far. And uh, this is part of a monthly webinar series. So we're gonna do another one in the month of November, December, so on and so forth, where we cover another topic or aspect about your recruiting journey and how to put these things into practice. Just um, a sneak peek at what I've got coming up for those of you who are in this um, webinar, you, you are hearing it first, but um, I'm looking at how far you all are um, progressing in the Career Launchpad modules. So um, I'm not sure what the final date is, but if you can finish all of the modules before March 1st, I believe is the date that I'm gonna choose you'll be entered to win a pair of AirPods. So, you know, you've Pretty got good. Thanksgiving break coming up. You've got winter break coming up. Um, I know, you know, you've got finals coming up as well. Um, so don't jeopardize your, your education, but if you can get all of these modules completed by then, you'll be entered to win a pair of AirPods. So um, do, do look at the modules. Um, do come to these webinars with questions from the modules if you have them. Um, and then if you have any questions, reach out to me or Sahil or Erica. A new job and AirPods, not a bad deal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah, we're, we're very excited. I think um, it, it, I can't stress enough how um, sometimes students might feel like you might be listening to this whole webinar and you're like, well, I don't really need to do it today or I'm busy. I can kind of push it off until whenever. But the sooner that you put these things into practice, the more time you're going to have to explore and meet people and learn about what you want to do. I think it gets really challenging when students come to me and they're like, I recently graduated. You know, I have like one month left before I run out of like life savings or like when I, when the bills start piling up, like I need to find a job now. And that's where you can't do a lot of the fun research, getting to know people, whatever. You just kind of have to apply to whatever is existing out there and, and s settle for it. So to Eric's point, the sooner that you can do it, the better. It, it's just going to make you so more well-rounded about how you think about recruiting. Great. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much, Sahil. Of course, and a recording of this will be made available. I think Erica and Eric uh, will make it available through the career website. Also, um, Eric, do we have another, do we have a date scheduled already for next month's webinar? We do. Um, <laughs> I think it's November 18th or do I remember that correctly? I don't know. I believe it's November 18th. Give me one second to find it. Oh my goodness. You mean you don't remember it off the top of your head? <laughs> I have career services, I have campus program, and everybody else is program. <laughs> I'm teasing. I should have it at the top of my head, too. <laughs> <laughs> One second. I have it right here. Um... It is the 18th. Oh, okay, November 18th. Look at someone else on their game. November 18th. Tattooed. <laughs> November 18th at 11 a.m. And then we have our December date on December 10th at 3 p.m. Cool. All Thank right. You. See everyone there. Hope to see everyone there again. Thank you Thank all. You. Take care. Bye. Take care. Bye. Thank you.